Welcome to this webinar organized by PSYTU, the Finnish Association for Psychedelic Research. Today's speaker is uh, Ido Hartokson, and he's an associate professor at the um, uh, graduate program in, in science, technology and society in the University of uh, Barilan. Um, and he's a, he's a scholar, uh, published books about uh, psychedelics as, as uh, technology and uh, today he will be speaking telling uh, speaking about the uh, context or the set and setting in in in, uh, in this field um, so with this I'll give the um, zoom for you Ido. thank you Ika uh, so hi hello everybody hey hey <laughs> i um, very pleased to be here tonight, and I, I want to start on a personal note. Uh, I've been quite busy as of late, but I've had trouble declining this kind invitation by your association. Uh, so I want to confess at the start that I have a weak spot for the Finnish people everywhere I traveled in the world. Uh, I've always found myself connecting to Finnish people, always, uh, and only uh, recently found out that there's a vibrant uh, psychedelic research scene uh, in, in Finland, maybe not only research scene. So I, I felt obliged to accept this invitation to forge the, this connection with, uh, with this community. Uh, and hopefully I want to someday get to Finland and get to know you all in person. So thank you again for this invitation and uh, please accept this as my humble gesture of appreciation for uh, Finnish people, Finnish culture, and all things Finnish. Uh, now I'll get to, uh, to my talk. To first, uh, presenting myself. Um, as said, I'm a, a, an, an assistant professor, actually, at the Science, Technology, and Society program at bar -Ilan University. Um, and I've been studying psychedelics from the over the past decade and a half from the perspective of science and technology studies, focusing on how psychedelics behave as a technology and specifically the concept of set and setting, the idea that the content and the quality of experiences with psychedelics are shaped by the context. And this research has led me to write the book, American Trip, uh, Set Setting and the Psychedelic Experience in the 20th Century. Uh, it appeared in 2020 with MIT Press, and uh, it attempts to map how sense setting shaped the psychedelic experience uh, for individuals, but also how they do it for individuals, but also more generally, more broadly for entire culture. And entire culture is focusing on the story of mid 20th century psychedelic research in the States. So today I want to share some key insights from my research on sense setting over the past several years, drawing from my book and also from several other papers and pointing to the relevance of this concept of sense setting for medical research and also to drug policy. So I'll start with uh, the basic concept of sense setting. I imagine most of you have heard about it and uh, know it to some extent, but uh, I'll still begin with the, with the basic facts. Uh, it's probably the most fundamental recurring concept in psychedelic theory of practice. And what it means basically is that the effects of a psychedelic substance are not preordained, they're not predetermined, but instead uh, they are shaped by other factors. And we're talking about two main types of factors. First, psychological factors, so that is the set. And here we find things like expectations, uh, intentions, what, the, what kind of intentions people are uh, bringing to this experience, the personality structure, and the mood entering this experience. So this is the set, first type of, of, of factor. Uh, second type of, of factor uh, is environmental factors, uh, and that is the setting. So where is uh, this experience taking place? Is it taking place in the woods, uh, in a party, in a clinic, in a church? Uh, who are the people around? Are they friends or clinicians or strangers? And finally, what's the grander uh, 
cultural context for this experience. So um, culture has great significance to shaping experiences with psychedelics in ways that we might not be aware of uh, in uh, when, when thinking about these things first. So the types of messages our culture gives us about these experiences, about their worth, whether they're worthwhile or whether they're wrong, um, and the framework that it gives us to thinking about, um, about these experiences, about, about reality and generally, uh, they shape the way that psychedelic experiences are interpreted and experienced by, by individuals. So these are uh, three types of, of factors uh, thinking about set and setting. And these ideas of set and setting are nothing new. They appear in indigenous culture. And there is a acute awareness in these cultures that sense the, this experience is susceptible to cues, to suggestions, and shamans have a toolbox of, of, um, for, for directing, calibrating experiences of clients. And they use ritual, ritual songs, they use smoke, they use whistles, sacred objects, so on and so forth. So shamans, no sense setting. But at the same time, uh, while we have this as some form of implicit uh, indigenous knowledge, this insight about the crucialness of these extra pharmacological factors, um, extra pharmacological meaning non-pharmacological, everything aside from the drug, this recognition of the importance of these factors has generally been absent from Western psychiatry. So when psychedelics first came into, uh, became interesting for psychiatry, uh, it took time for this realization to sink in and of, of just how responsive these agents are to context. And in American Trip, I dedicate a lot of time to cover the evolution of this idea, of this realization in the 1950s and the 1960s, leading to uh, Timothy Leary, who coined the term sense setting. I'm sure many of you heard of, of Leary. Leary didn't invent anything new, really, when he uh, coined this term. And most of these ideas were uh, er explored by earlier authors that I cover in the book. But what Leary did do was give uh, the idea a catchy name, and he experimented with a wider variety of set and settings than other, any other researcher before or arguably even after. So he gave psychedelics to graduate students and to high security prisoners, to Protestant ministers, to beat poets. And he gave them in all these different settings in, in churches, in prisons, in suburban homes, in Bohemian crash pads. And so all of these very environment, many environments, very different kinds of people and different types of set and setting. And he also dedicated a lot of attention to the subject, theoretically. He popularized this term in books like The Psychedelic Experience, the classic book from 1964. And to do, today, for many people, Leary is this controversial 1960s rogue scientist that turned LSD evangelist and caused a lot of damage to 1960s psychedelic research. Uh, that might hold truth uh, to some extent, but if we want to look at the positive side of Leary, I think this is uh, the, the issue of sense setting, the concept of sense setting is where he made his most lasting contribution to the field of psychedelic science, and it stayed with us uh, to this day. And sense setting is today, since the 1960s, and to this day, arguably the most central organizing principle in the field of psychedelics. It's crucial to scientific uh, research of, uh, of this spectacular range of effects that psychedelics elicit. It's also crucial for psychedelic therapy, for any attempt to optimize the effects of psychedelics. It's relevant to professionals. It's also relevant to lay people, to psychonauts, to anybody who's interested in exploring psychedelics at using whatever framework. Uh, it's just crucial to getting whatever we're interested in getting from these agents. 
so I've, I've laid out this basic idea of certain setting, and now I want to turn and present some of the ideas that I've been exploring in my research on certain setting over the past years. And the first idea I want to I wanna present is this a crucial idea of psychedelic plurality. So in American Trip, I look at seven different schools of LSD research that existed in the 1950s and 1960s, all the way from CIA research on the one hand and research on LSD spirituality. And I show that the results of each of these types of research uh, oscillated very widely, depending on the set and the setting, which kind of expectations, which kind of intentions, which researchers were bringing into their work and which kind of research environments they were creating. So we had seven, at least seven research schools at the time that created their own microclimates of psychedelic experimentation and each producing very different types of results. And in some groups, uh, psychedelics were viewed as therapeutic tools, as spiritual tools, and individuals went through very thorough preparation before taking psychedelics, and they were expecting insights, epiphanies, transformation. But then you had other groups where psychedelics were seen as psychosis, mim mimicking drug, psychotomimetics. So... Uh, over there, the subject had very little knowledge about these drugs, about their effects, and they were just told that they're getting a drug that will make them crazy for several hours. In some of these groups, individuals spend the duration of the trip in a cozy room with friends or with a trusted therapist, and they would listen to music, they would paint, they would uh, roam the garden, they would lie down, they would rest. And in other groups, uh, they would spend the experience in hospital rooms or in psychiatric wards and were required to perform endless batteries of psychological tests. So um, quite, uh, um, quite distinct differences there. Uh, and many others that I, I won't go into, but I think if you... If you think about the principle of sense sitting and apply it here, it's pretty clear that these types of very different environments uh, result in different types of outcomes. And indeed, this is exactly what happened. Uh, and it happened to the extent that uh, by the end of the 1950s, researchers were unable to agree on what the effects of psychedelics really are. And they came to very different kinds of definitions for, for these agents. So on the, on the one hand, you had uh, one group or several groups really claiming that LSD is a cognitive disruptor. But then you had other groups saying it is a cognitive enhancer. You had some groups saying uh, LSD and psychedelics induce psychosis. And then you have other groups who claimed uh, these drugs heal the mind. And you had one group saying it was such a horrible experience that nobody ever wants to repeat this experience. But then you had other groups saying the complete opposite, that they gave it to people and they just keep coming back for more because they love it so much. So completely uh, diametrically opposed results of research and if you read the results by these groups, it's really like they're talking about completely different drugs. And the drugs were, of course, the same. And what was different, what was different in reality was, of course, the set and the setting. And here we get to another question, which is why are set and setting so important with psychedelics specifically? And to answer this question of, of why we think about sense setting specifically in regards to psychedelics, we need to get to, we need to understand one of the most essential characteristics of, of these agents. Uh, they've been called famously by uh, LSD psychiatrist Stanislav Grof, who's one of the founders of psychedelic therapy, 
they've been called non-specific agents. And the idea is that the effects of these agents are non-specific. They can go either way. They can go, they can become beatific or horrific, delightful, excruciating. There isn't a preordained direction in the uh, psychedelic uh, when taking a psychedelic. So they're basically dependent on the extra pharmacological factors, as I've said before. Uh, so non-specific magnifiers, that's, that's the idea. And they've been described really uh, many times as magnifiers, as amplifiers of consciousness, as telescopes and as microscopes. And what this comes down to is this idea that psychedelic effects are first and foremost recognized by this tendency, in tendency to intensify the experience. Which is why Adolf Huxley gave his book about the psychedelic experience this title, Heaven and Hell. So both heaven and hell can be glimpsed from within the psychedelic experience, and it's a question of the set and the setting. To experience the world through a psychedelic prism means to experience it on a higher level of intensity. Uh, so this is why with this experience, we ex uh, one experiences intensified colors, intensified sounds, intensified feelings, insights, relationships, all of these things are augmented and enhanced. And this is also why a uh, psychedelic experience can feel magical or nightmarish. And maybe perhaps why ordinary reality seems dull in comparison, because it doesn't have the same level of intensity that these experiences had, which makes it both potentially magical or, or nightmarish. And this also gives us a clue about set and setting and why they matter so much with psychedelics. So I've already said um, expectation, intention, environment, they're always important. They're important regardless of whether uh, one is taking a substance or not in, the, in any situation in our lives, but they become increasingly crucial in the, concept of a, in the context of a psychedelic experience. Because under a psychedelic uh, substance, everything is amplified and augmented. So a pleasant experience can become ecstatic. And on the other hand, a passing anxiety can become full-blown paranoia. And this amplified quality of this psychedelic experience is something that I discuss in one of my papers, the meaning enhancing properties of psychedelics and media, their mediator role in psychedelic therapy, spirituality, and creativity. Over there, I discuss this idea that it's that this enhanced meaning, enhanced intensity is maybe the most crucial feature of the psychedelic experience. And we can see this in the fact that scientists are working hard to show that psychedelics are effective in therapy or affecting in many different kinds of ways. But one of the most consistent results that we keep getting in, in psychedelic research is uh, just how effective these agents are in creating a sense of deep meaning. So, for example, two-thirds of those who have a psychedelic experience describe it as one of the five most meaningful experiences of their lives. And one-third says it was the single most meaningful experience they've had in their life. And so meaning is very, very clearly evoked during these experiences, a, a profound sense of meaning. And we can actually even find clues for this in the very word psychedelic. So uh, the word psychedelic, psychedelic, uh, it's literally mind manifesting as, as many of you probably know and mind revealing, they're saying to reveal or manifest the contents of the mind. And we can look at it at a slightly different way and think about how revealing or manifesting is really quite similar to amplifying, to augmenting, to enhancing. Um, so phenomena are accentuated, are enhanced, are revealed, are manifested. Um, 
and this has a uh, great significance so so heaven and hell uh, both depend on same setting and this brings me uh, to the next issue which is the idea of collective set and setting so I've, I've now covered why set and setting are so important on psychedelics tying this with the idea of this meaning enhancement, this intensified experience, which makes the environment and the context so uh, so important and why it can become, on one hand, very stressful, distressful, or on the other hand, uh, ecstatic and healing. And now I'm getting to this idea of the, the collective set and setting, uh, which is an idea that I explore both in this uh, earlier paper, uh, uh, the, uh, on the history of sense setting, as well as in American Trip, more fully. Um, and this idea is, is basically trying to extend the original concept of sense setting uh, by realizing that sense setting does not exist in a vacuum. So if we're thinking about these microclimates of sense setting that we mentioned before, they are all obviously dependent on surrounding climates of psychology, of psychiatry, of science and society and culture. So uh, none of these things exist in a vacuum. And that's a crucial point at, um, uh, of, of, my, of my research about the cultural sense saying that, that we try to extract ourselves from the taking for granted the assumption that certain setting is an individualistic component, that it's, it's just about uh, the specific situation in which someone ingests a substance and, uh, and the environment around this person. So this is how people usually think about certain setting. But uh, really, if you think about it, all of these parameters of sense setting are dependent on the surrounding culture. So whether it's expectations or intentions when going into a psychedelic experience, those are completely informed by the culture and what it tells the individual about these experiences, what it can expect, what kind of intention they might bring or not even think about bringing into this experience. Um, the, the types of people you're with, uh, the, the social environment, uh, the physical environment, all of that is shaped by the culture, obviously, and uh, the kind of individuals the, the, the society produces, the types of relationships it, it supports, the spaces it creates. So really, we can see that the psychedelic experience is quite intimately linked with the culture we live in. So there are actually, I would argue, two levels of the same setting. Uh, one level is the individual level, uh, which is the more, uh, perhaps, uh, better known one. But then it doesn't exist by itself. It sits on top of a broader, more fundamental level of collective sense setting. And we can find evidence in this, for this in, in many different um, bits, of in bits of research uh, from medical science and from anthropology. Uh, and to give one example that I like a lot, um, in the 1950s, uh, anthropologist Anthony Wallace wrote about different cultures and how they think differently about hallucinations. And Wallace argued that the differences in the conception of hallucinations has implications for individuals. So we argued that basically, um, individuals from Western cultures would have more negative uh, experiences with psychedelic, with hallucinogens, because in these cultures, halluc uh, hallucinations are equated with mental illness. And one of the interesting test cases he brought was showing that there was uh, huge differences in the effects of mescaline on white Americans that participated in clinical trials with mescaline, and Native Americans that participated in peyote ceremonies with a Native American church. So the active agent in peyote is mescaline. It's the same substance. According to that, one would think that the effect should be the same. 
but they weren't. So white individuals in clinical trials with masculine experienced mood swings, they became sexual, they became suspicious, aggressive, and experienced feelings of meaninglessness, loss of contact with reality. On the other hand, participants in rituals by the Native American church uh, had very different types of experience, no mood swings, no aggression, no sexual behavior, no suspiciousness. They just had calm presence, full of awe, full of satisfaction. And instead of feeling out of touch with reality, they felt like they were contacting a higher level of reality that enhanced their meaning. So we can see here that culture matters. It can modify and modulate the effect of the psychedelic substance, in this case, masculine, in radical ways, in ways that are uh, facts re reflective of what I discussed earlier about the very different types of results that psychedelic researcher, researchers were getting in the, in the 1950s. And again, as, as, as I noted, Wallace argued that people in the West are at greater risk of uh, having uh, negative experiences with hallucinogens because of Western society's uh, um, stigmas and stereotypes about hallucinations. And sure enough, um, one decade later, in the 19, late 1960s, the American government proved Wallace right. It started a campaign against psychedelics and the rate of bad trips blew up in a few short years. Uh, we can remind ourselves that the late 60s were a time when psychedelic users were heavily persecuted by law and press was filled with scare stories about psychedelics. People were told psychedelics cause chromodome damage. They turn kids into mutants. It fries the brain. It gives you flashbacks. And this was believed, basically. And in this atmosphere, the risk of paranoia blew up. And if you look at the history of uh, 1960 psychedelic culture, you can see that there was a shift in the meaning of the psychedelic experience. And suddenly the idea of danger became much more prominent, strongly associated with psychedelics. And you had a spike with, in the rate of bad trips accompanying this change of, of cultural perspective on these drugs and what they do. So now I want to get to uh, a different topic, um, which is the subject of placebo and how the idea of sense setting relates to placebo. In 2016, I published this paper, uh, Set Setting Psychedelics and the Placebo Response. Um, I'm, uh, it's the wrong side, but... Uh, but the, the title of the paper, uh, for those of you who are interested, are is set setting uh, psychedelics and the placebo response. Uh, oh, it is the right side, sorry. Um, and so in, in this paper, I'm interested in um, pointing to the similarities between concepts, the, the concept of set setting and the concept of placebo. And I'm sure many of you or all of you know what, what placebo response is. I'll just briefly restate that the placebo response is the name we give to the ability of any treatment, even fake, fake or in inactive treatments to produce um, an improvement in the condition of the patient. And we generally ascribe this improvement by using an inactive substance or by not really uh, performing any real type of treatment uh, to expectations, uh, expectancy generally, and many other types of factors really, though we concentrate on, on the expectancy, but uh, other factors go in uh, there as well, as I'll, I'll show in a moment. And the question, that I deal with in this paper is the relationship with sense setting and placebo. And really, uh, when you think about it, these two types of, of concepts are, are strong, strongly related. They're both theories or descriptions of the ways in which non-pharmacological factors 
shape response to drugs and to therapy. So both are about non uh, about non pharmacology or extra pharmacology, and both focus on the same kind of non pharmacological factors. So ex- expectation, intention, physical environment, social environment, cultural environment, and in my paper I have uh, this slide uh, or <laughs> this table. That, um, that looks at these different factors and how it's basically addressed in, in papers both on sense setting and on placebo. So there's a strong similarity here. And the question that emerges is uh, whether these two things are the same or are, how are we to distinguish between them? Um, and I think that we have a reason to distinguish between them and not just um, not just erase the concept of sense setting or um, or include it in inside the concept of placebo. I think it 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 adds more depth because first of all, uh, the idea of sense setting is concerned with the idea the, with response to psychoactive drugs specifically, uh, mostly psychedelics. And placebo is a theory that extends to all types of therapeutic intervention. So there's something different going on here. Um, secondly, and perhaps more crucially, uh, placebo is aimed at medical prof- uh, professionals and it's descriptive. It's about how placebo influences response to treatment. Set and setting, on the other hand, is prescriptive. So uh, it provides guidelines it's, it's not just about describing or maybe in, in the context of medical research trying to eliminate these extra pharmacological um, factors, but it's about actually um, thinking about optimizing them, about how to get better results with psychedelics. And it's part of a larger discussion that's not just held by a medical or scientific community, it's a discussion that uh, that's held by the broader psychedelic community, if we want to use this term. Um, so it's more inclusive in a sense, and uh, it's interesting to think about uh, how this term is uh, is both relevant and uh, and used within the context of research, but it's also one that uh, the many individuals that are not uh, in any way uh, part of. Of, of scientific research also find merit in or, or useful, that, are, that find useful. And the third and, um, and perhaps even more crucial um, difference is the placebo is unidimensional. So it basically just looks at one parameter, uh, basically did the patient get better or not get better, get better or get worse, so on. Uh, set and setting is, much more multidimensional. It offers a much richer um, framework to thinking about these these types of phenomena. And when I when you think about sense setting and psychedelics, as I mentioned before, it comes into play uh, when we speak about spiritual experiences, therapeutic experiences, creative experiences, aesthetic experiences, and many many different types of experiences. So there's not just one specific um, index that we're interested in, but it's it's much more multidimensional. And I think there's also uh, an interesting thing that that happens that when we try to bring these two related but also distinct types of theory together. Um, and the, First, over the years, there's been a criticism uh, about the use of placebo. So there, there is the claim that the term placebo is basically a misnomer. It's, it's a wrong term to use because placebo, by definition, is inactive. The, the, so the definition of placebo is that it is inactive. It's unable to produce an effect or a response. So, so calling something a placebo, Talking about placebo response is like, um, or placebo effect is like the no no effect effect or, or something like that. So you have 
medical anthropologists, for example, uh, Daniel Mormon, that says we need to exchange this term with the term meaning response, because really what people respond to is not the placebo, it's not this sugar pill or whatever they're getting or a conversation with a physician that's enough in itself to, to start a, a process of healing. What these people are reacting to is the meaning that they ascribe to, to, this, um, to what, whatever um, they participate in whether it's, it's a drug or it's a conversation or, or any sort of, uh, of process that's, that's activated. So it's, uh, it's not the placebo response, it's response to meaning. And this brings me back to this idea that I mentioned earlier, that psychedelics enhance meaning. Uh, and because the sex placebo response is basically meaning response, uh, so um, we can take the, the idea that psychedelics enhance meaning and, and come to the conclusion that psychedelics might enhance meaning response. In other words, they, can, they enhance the perception of meaning and they can enhance the placebo response. So they could be conceptualized as a kind of super placebo. They're an agent that augments placebo response. And think about psychedelics in this way can help explain the staggering variety of conditions that are helped using psychedelics because beyond depression and anxiety and addiction and PTSD and OCD, there's just a whole range of reports about psychedelics being effective in treating uh, really a plethora, uh, an abundance of conditions from stuttering to cancer and to allergy, uh, allergies. And of course, a lot of this is anecdotal, but I think if we look at it from the perspective of the super placebo concept, that may explain some of what we're seeing in these reports. And this may give us a different perspective on, on, on psychedelic science in a sense, because usually placebo is seen by, by medical science as something redundant, something that we need to eliminate from the picture to get an impartial account of, of drug effects. But at the same time, research also tells us that placebo is powerful and that placebo plays a very significant role in clinical trials with drugs. So we get this a very broad effect that we, of, of psychedelics that, that may be useful. We can imagine that if we have a drug that is able to enhance placebo, in, if, and if psychedelics are able to universally enhance placebo, then it turns them, in a sense, into true panaceas, uh, agents that are able to help recovery and support health in many different types of conditions by enhancing this, this placebo response. And this then has the potential to make, to, to contribute dramatic gains for medical science across the board. Okay, so now I wanna, I wanna get to, to medical uh, science, drug research, and, um, and think about how this translates into the world of medical science, and of, uh, and of drug policy if we have time. So beginning with drug research, uh, when, you, when you consider the question of sense setting, it's obvious it has profound implications for drug research. And over the past 60 years, medical research was generally organized about around this idea of RCTs, randomized controlled trials, and they're, uh, they're, they're designed to help us separate a drug's putatively, um, uh, putatively um, side effect or placebo effect from, from, the, from the real effect of the drug, the, the intrinsic effect, sorry, uh, from the placebo effect. So that being described uh, placebo effect has been described as all of those things that are stemming from those 
extra pharmacological factors. All of the ways in, this, in which these extra pharmacological factors help healing and, and therapeutic outcomes. But if you think about the therapeutic uses of psychedelics, it becomes evident that this model is poorly suited for measuring the efficacy of psychedelics. Because if the effects of, and the efficacy of psychedelics are dependent on the context, are dependent on this extra pharmacology, then you can't separate the substance from the context, which is what RCTs are designed to do. You can't separate it from the placebo, as we, as we call it, which is another name to set and setting, as, as, I've, as I've described. And in this case, it becomes incumbent upon us to consider that um, uh, this injunction by Tully and Pratt, um, who wrote uh, um, this in the 1960s, and I'm, I'm reading, uh, the quixotic attempt to eliminate the effects of participant observations um, in the name of misplaced pseudo objectivity is fruitless, not so much because it is impossible, but, it, but because it is unproductive. The question becomes not how to eliminate bias of participant observation, but how to optimally account for and exploit the effects of the participant observation transaction in terms of the purposes of research. In other words, when we try to make psychedelic science objective by trying to eliminate certain setting, we may end up betraying and sabotaging the attempts to optimize therapeutic results. And we may actually create a suboptimal set and setting. And again, looking at the history of psychedelic research, and when we look at the 1960s, we had the Canadian Addiction Research Fund trying to challenge results of early psych uh, psychedelic research on LSD and addiction. And they were determined to arrive at an objective measurement of LSD effects. They attempted to replicate earlier LSD studies, but disregarding all of these set and setting stuff, basically uh, trying to create the objective result of, of LSD, but this failed miserably. And the failure was not because the earlier work was flawed, but because by trying to create this objective, quote unquote, set and setting, uh, this just leads to an in inadequate substandard set and setting that's detrimental to achieving the therapeutic results. So you can't separate the effects of psychedelics from placebo response because the extra pharmacological dimensions of psychedelic, psychedelics are crucial and it's futile in this sense to try to eliminate placebo because this runs the risk of missing what is perhaps the most exciting potential psychedelics bring to the table. If psychedelics amplify, if they intensify and enhance meaning, as I've argued, then this means that they're intimately involved with placebo response, um, again, as I've, um, as I've argued uh, in, in this paper. So if we understand placebo response to be essentially response to meaning, um, we what emerges is this idea of psychedelics as enhancing placebo response. And this may, may just have uh, uh, opened up immense horizons for, for psychedelic, for medical research more, more generally. And we're at a crucial moment right now uh, in the field of psychedelic science and how it relates to RCTs. And for those of you, us that uh, know um, the history of psychedelic research in the 50s and 60s, we find that the rise of RCTs actually played a, a large role also in the challenges uh, of psychedelic research at the time, not just the political reasons. There were other reasons that had to do with this new golden standard and the challenges that it, that it created specifically for psychedelic research. And today we have a new wave of psychedelic science that's attempted to 
both follow the rules of the RCT games, um, even when it's less than ideal for the purposes, but also keep the principles of sense setting in, 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 in other ways. And in the future, the insights about the limitations of the RCT models uh, coming from the world of psychedelic research may converge with other lines of critique on the centrality of, of RCTs and challenge maybe um, the RCT model in some ways, not in order to discard it entirely, uh, but maybe to show that there are other, uh, other ways uh, that can be useful and productive for studying psychedelics and, and maybe other types of, of, of drugs as well. And in American Trip, I draw on the insights of British sociologist, Michael Burroway, Burroway, and he provides a template for reflexive science. He lays a theoretical foundation for a sociology that's reflective on context. So he, uh, he argues that uh, um, he, he proposes a, a paradigm that challenges or inverts the pillars of positivist science, which are uh, react reactivity, uh, real reliability, replicability, and uh, representativeness. And he proposes instead uh, a different kind of sociological science that takes context into the equation and works with context rather than trying to eliminate it. Um, so, for example, um, understanding that intervention is, is part of the equation and, um, and cherishing the, the, the process and, um, and by, by adding a dimension of situatedness to, to the results. So I won't go into the details of this model, but it's a starting point. It can be, a, it may be a starting point, I think, for larger discussions that can be held regarding the ways to study drugs and pharmacology that are reflective on context. And, and that's maybe a, a, a place where we can uh, integrate these ideas also into medical research. So we have less than uh, 10 minutes left and uh, for my talk. So I'll, I'll just uh, shortly uh, uh, point to a few ways that this is also relevant to questions of, of drug policy. And I'll start by mentioning that we've had uh, over the past couple of years, uh, the emergent, emergence of what I call a new culture of set and setting. So it's, I'm talking about uh, books and organizations and websites and, um, and manuals that guide people on how to create safe, supportive set and setting for experiences with psychedelics. So I, I think that's generally um, uh, a positive development. One, uh, I think one of the insights that we may gain from, from this research is that governments and, um, um, and social institutions have a responsibility for creating uh, positive containers for experiences with psychedelics and realizing that really when these uh, agents are, are just demonized, we're basically uh, exacerbating the harms. And, um, and also on, on a broader level, thinking, um, I, I won't really get much into that, but thinking about the, the, the story of uh, Bruce Alexander's Red Park, I'll just very rapidly state, uh, Red Park was an experiment uh, by Bruce Alexander, a psychologist, uh, known for his uh, addiction research. And he was interested in revisiting a lot of classic research that so showed that drugs like morphine or cocaine or amphetamines are addictive um, by putting rats in a, in a cage and giving them the opportunity to uh, self-inject and they would self-inject, become uh, compulsive users and often overdose. And Bruce Alexander posited that maybe the, the reason for these outcomes was not just the, the substance, but the context that these uh, animals were living uh, in a very isolated, boring, 
uh, lonely life in which uh, uh, these drugs were sort of soulless. So, so no wonder that they, they were so attracted to these. And he built this uh, uh, contraption, which his lab called the Red Park. And over there, these rats uh, had uh, chances to, to mate and they had nice places to nest in. And, and 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 toys and mating opportunities to so so uh, so they tried to provide these very different kind of context and they found out that these rats did not get addicted did not overdose did not develop compulsive um, habits of use and quite astonishingly uh, even when the researchers tried to add more and more sugar to the mix to get them addicted they preferred the plain water. So uh, in terms of drug policy, I think what we may learn from this, um, from, this, um, from this example is just how in our society, impoverished kinds of uh, environments, like for example, example ghetto slums, uh, or maybe just um, dreary life environments of, of everyday uh, modern existence uh, are uh, are conducive to creating addictions, which is something that Bruce Alexander definitely speaks about. And it also really, um, really points to the great effect that sense setting has on, on such things that like addiction and overdose that we didn't, we don't usually think about as relating to set and setting. And I also mentioned the story of heroin addiction by American soldiers in, in Vietnam. So they were about 20% of soldiers uh, at the time that were addicted to heroin and the American government tried to get them uh, rehabilitated in Vietnam, uh, but with very little success. And there was a lot of concern that once these people get back to the US, there would be a, a heroin addiction epidemic by these vast numbers of soldiers that were addicted to heroin in Vietnam. But then when they got back to, to the States, uh, almost 90% basically recovered without seeking any treatment just by look, moving out of this context, this set and setting that was, you know, uh, that was characterized by by isolation and by boredom and by feelings of meaninglessness or horror. And over there, heroin was very attractive, but once they got back to their lives, um, then, then it wasn't as attractive anymore. So, so this really shows us uh, in, in a, a, another way in which sense setting um, is significant, highly significant for, for our culture. And to bring all this together, I think it leads us to the realization that drug policy has generally been barking up the wrong tree, uh, focusing on the types of drugs that we prohibit or allow. Uh, and sense setting might give us a different perspective that tells us it's less about the, the specific drug and more about the context. And this has more to do with the types of relationships that people develop with, with um, mind-altering substances of any kind, uh, illicit or illicit. Um, so I think uh, to close that we might use these insights to think about uh, progressive drug policy that integrates these ideas of sense setting to improve these conditions on a social, cultural level to help people uh, avoid uh, compulsive, harmful relationships with, with psychoactives of all sorts and, and, and maybe be able to foster more safe, more meaningful relationships. And this may be, in a sense, part of the education or, or toolkit that every citizen may get in, in a future progressive society, as, as we may call it, and, and may help to mitigate drug, drug harms and maximize their benefits. So to sum up, um, I've tried to show stand setting are crucial for psychedelics, they're crucial for psychedelic science and for therapy, for drug policy. And this has broad implications that go beyond the field of psychedelics 
um, and it's relevant to other types of drug experiences and to and and to thinking about human experiences, human experience more generally even. So as scholars, as scientists, as therapists, and even as citizens, we have much to gain by keeping these uh, ideas in mind and integrating them into science, into policy, and into any container we, we want to use to, to hold these experiences with psychedelics. So I'll end here on this note and um, I'm happy to have a discussion about all of these, uh, all of these uh, issues. Thank you. Wow, great. Okay, thank you, Ido. Uh, maybe first we'll take the uh, question. You, you touched on this briefly at, at the end. Uh, Alexi, you, you, could you open your microphone to ask this question? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. You kind of touched upon this already, but my question was, can this set and setting be applied to other drugs like alcohol, like other drugs and medicines? I mean, you touched upon it a bit, but could you kind of go a bit deeper? Sure. Huh. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Um, so, yeah, th th this idea is definitely relevant to other types of of uh, of compounds, and we have a um, seminal book by, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the researchers, but it's called uh, Drunken Comportment, about the, the effect of alcohol. We, and there's actually a whole field of research on the extra pharmacology of alcohol effects. And we find, for example, that when you give people uh, non-alcoholic beverages, but you tell them that there's alcohol inside, they start behaving more, they start becoming more disinhibited and uh, maybe more aggressive, maybe more sexual. And on the other hand, when you give them alcoholic drinks, but turn them, there's no alcohol inside, you get uh, the opposite kind of reaction. So, so, so yeah, there's uh, expectations play a huge part there. And um, probably in all forms of, uh, of psychoactives and, and also non-psychoactive substances. And as I would argue, they're really related to any kind of, of life experience that, that we go into. Uh, it's just that with psychedelics, uh, this is enhanced because of the reasons that I've, that I've mentioned before. Yeah, definitely. I can come up with lots of examples on that. I, I remember also a study about uh, uh, it was related to an uh, ayah um, was it an ayahuasca ceremony, some some psychedelic ceremony where where it was actually placebo that the people were given and. and uh, oh yeah, there was. <laughs> yeah, there was yeah. lately also a, a nice paper tripping on nothing, uh, that it was called about people that were given. Uh, a placebo and we're told that they're getting a psychedelic and they had quite powerful psychoactive experiences, many of them, and entered this altered state just from the placebo or the set in the setting, whatever we decide to call it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it was that, was that paper, exactly. Okay, then, then uh, there's some questions from Anonymous attendees so i'll uh, i'll read the top voted one first um are there studies or other sources of information about how psychedelics are experienced what their effects are like for people who have no expectations no prior knowledge or belief about them yeah um yeah that's interesting um i don't know that there's any that there are any studies on on this specifically i think i mean it would i i imagine be against the the um you know ethical uh concerns of research because uh, well you can't give people uh, these substances without telling them what they're going to do um i think it's 
you know, it's interesting. First of all, when, when you look at some of this research on, from the 1950s, a lot of these people had very little prior knowledge. And uh, so sometimes they were told they were go going to get this thing uh, that's going to make them crazy, but other times they didn't know anything. And yeah, I think, I think these kinds of situations really provide a very interesting uh, canvas on which to explore the, the effects of, of psychedelics. And, and they're quite rare, but maybe you can meet them in some kinds of situations. Like I think I, I used to serve um, as a volunteer in this uh, harm reduction organization that worked in, in Cytrans parties. And sometimes you'd meet these people that, 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 um, that didn't have any types of, of any, any knowledge basically on what they're going to experience before they started. So, so yeah, but I don't know any kind of, um, of, of, of uh, like real system methodic research on that. I think that would be um, fascinating if it were possible. Uh, you mentioned, you said in, in your book, you write about the uh, experiments of the CIA. I'm, I'm not uh, too familiar with them, but what I've heard is that, uh, they, um, if I understood it, they 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 gave LSD to people who didn't know they're getting any. Right. So oh yeah, the, that's true. So this was in the fifties when there was maybe not so much public knowledge about. Uh, right, but then, but then, so what happened to these people? Do you know? Yeah. Right. First, first of all, um, it's funny you mentioned it because you know thinking about it from the perspective of what we said about having people experience these these agents without knowing anything about them. So this is kind of similar uh, when these people had no knowledge of, of these ex of of the effects uh, th that they're even getting a drug, so they didn't have anything to expect. Only this is a very actually a very bad kind of of. Uh, in context to, it's because you're starting to have these experiences and you don't know why they're happening so it's quite alarming and um, and generally um, it, it's also interesting because in the, the CIA um, the CIA people also experimented on themselves and it's interesting to see that you know on the one hand I say sense sending is so crucial but also I try to the book in the book to you know walk this fine line of also recognizing that there are other elements beyond sensing. For example, uh, many of these or some of the CIA people, even though they took this in this psychotomy medic framework where they thought this is some kind of truth serum or something that allows you to brainwash somebody or these these types of ideas, they ended up having uh, epiphanies and spiritual experiences. So it shows you that you can approach that, you know, it's not uh, set in stone. And as for the people that were, uh, that were part of these uh, highly unethical experiments, and uh, we, we may note that in, in these exp ex so-called experiments, they were not scientific experiments in any way, but um, they were given to, uh, to prisoners and they were given, um, the, the CIA started basically uh, bordels. Uh, and so, and they were given by prostitutes to clients uh, while CIA um, agents were sitting behind the two-way mirror. So they were observing all the time. Um, and I know that at least in some of these cases, uh, people sued, I mean, it took some time until these things came to light. Came, uh, but later on, some people sued the American government for, for these experiments and definitely felt that this was, um, well, you know, um, a, a sort of like psychoactive rape, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems it's quite, uh, quite difficult or unethical to to try to remove that uh, um, expectation. Uh, I, I, yeah, but you know, we might get, we might be able to do this using some sort of uh, observation, not observational, but you know, you might be able to, to run a questionnaire with people who had these types of experiences without knowing anything about it. Um, I would just think that there are not that many types of people like that uh, 
thankfully, and that I guess these people aren't necessarily the ones that would later be looking into scientific research uh, and participating in it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, next question upvoted also from Anonymous. Out of all the potential directions you could take with set and setting, which one seemed to be useful for the patients? What seemed to be the best practices for set and setting? Let's imagine a therapeutic or psychonaut context. Right. So, you know, there's um, there's this standard type of, of set and setting uh, that's evolved since the 50s and 60s. And... Um, and the standard type, I'm, I'm saying this, it sounds bad. I'm not saying this uh, uh, in any judgmental way, though. But you know, it's uh, it's having the it's having this cozy environment that is often described as like a, a living room-like environment with a couch and a pillow and a, a, a possibility to rest. And and people often use. Um, um, headphones and, and listen to music um, and you have soft lighting. So all these things, I think the definitely you can't err on, on the side of, of like having, having soft lighting and having the, uh, having uh, some form of music or having the, the possibility to rest uh, or, or nature around when that's part of the, uh, of the context. It, it's, it's always good. Um, I think today we also have some, so, and, and you have more and more studies these days that are looking at the um, at the role of each of these components in in psychedelic therapy, and we you know we we see how important music is. But then uh, we also maybe today try to think about these issues uh, in a more multifaceted way. For example, um, you have studies by Mendel Kellen that. Um, that compare different types of music. Like traditionally, it was usually in classical music that was used, but then you know today, uh, trying to use uh, other types of music and seeing how 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 these maybe shape the experience. You have research to, for many other types of factors, um, but I think what this gets to think about this research specific research about music and different types of music is that. Um, is the sense setting? I mean, I, I think there would bef- definitely be those general, like uh, um, some rules for for how to to have psychedelic sessions, and there are things that are uh, inviolable, like like trust and and like um, like having a trusting relationship and like having a, a privacy. And like coming with a set intention, all of these things are, are clear and, and they're part of the equation, whatever the case. Um, but I think today there's also more openness to think about how maybe different types of populations uh, re- react differently, have different types of, of um, approach to these substances because one person might like classical music and another person might like electronic music and so you can't have one template working for everybody and I think I mean the, the question was mostly on the therapeutic context and I get uh, it's more uh, uh, it's it's more of a template there but also needs to be uh, sensitive to the individual and always have this kind of like uh, customized element that's that comes out of the relationship between uh, therapist and and client and on the psychonautic level i think because it was also mentioned um that really it differs from from person to person and there's no such thing as the ideal setting setting definitely i i was thinking um about in the therapeutic context, um, you mentioned super placebos and uh, um, the, I'm, I'm thinking of the models for, from, from MAPS in their MDMA PTSD studies and uh, holotropic, holotropic breathwork. They, they use, the, use a concept 
which is kind of a, like a suggestion for the it's working as a set for the for the therapy and they're suggesting that there's a like an inner healing intelligence in in uh in humans that can um treat kind of what well in the mdma studies it's for ptsd but in holotropic breath work it's uh kind of yeah it doesn't matter if it's ptsd or some some other anxieties or, or so on uh, do you think the this inner healing intelligence is it, um, do you consider the, uh, the same as a uh, super placebo what you were uh, mentioning yeah, that, earlier that's fascinating um yeah i've, I've come across this this idea of this uh, inner healing intelligence and i i think it's it's somewhat different because i think what the people in maps are referring to um is basically that yeah that we have this experience with psychedelic therapy with psychedelics generally that people kind of land on a way of healing that they find within themselves without having even anything uh, that's laid out anything that's planned just uh, this as, as they call it this kind of intelligence that leads people to to the in the direction of healing um and and that has to do also with with the set and the setting but it it's yeah i think it's it's closely related um um and definitely uh, reactive and dependent on, on placebo and certain setting uh, definitely a mechanism of, of placebo this this uh, inner healing intelligence um and it's it's maybe like one one type of um, mechanism or uh, or my, one type of uh, vector on which this occurs yeah okay the next question uh, is from from you so so make you, maybe you can open your microphone and ask it go ahead please oh, hello and uh, thanks for the lecture uh, yeah, I would like to ask about uh, this meaning and meaning response, which you said is a significant part of set and setting and placebo. Uh, and I'm thinking about what meaning is and how should we understand it, uh, or it's kind of left as a black box. And I think it's like both philosophically and in general, just very important question like that there is like semantic meanings but then we talk also about lack of meaning in person's life which is a bit different thing yeah it's yeah the word is used in many different meanings right yeah that's a good question um i i admit that um, i leave this question somewhat black, uh, black boxed um i think uh, first off yeah there are there are uh, very different types of, of, of meaning that we can think about. And psychedelics, uh, they have been also um, said to enhance the, the sense of meaningless, uh, meaningfulness of life more, more generally. Um, the, and there are different, there, there's the study of meaning, there are questionnaires that study meaning, and uh, so you, you can approach this on a variety of, of perspectives. And I guess this would be um, a direction for, for future study, like trying to tease out which types of meaning. My basic hypothesis or my basic argument is that just that the meaning of, of things, of of objects in consciousness whatever they are um they they are enhanced and i mean we we can for example see these when uh, you know people have ideas uh while on a second day trip or by the way also with uh cannabis which is also a meaning enhancer in in, in certain ways and we we all know this um this phenomenon of how these things suddenly appear to be to have immense meaning that uh, maybe uh, they made them later might not seem to have. And 
And so there's uh, it, it it works. And and you know you mentioned semantic meaning. Yeah, I think you know the the, the uh, one of the most fascinating effects of psychedelics is uh, the relationship to language, and uh, you can see it in in psychedelic poetry. And you know we, we're going to the direction of culture, but but really, uh, and there you can have this word that's kind of like its meaning is like teased out and and played with, and so the meaning kind of like bursts out of a word in many different ways. And, and and also as I've stated the, the the sense of meaningfulness in life is also enhanced so so yeah there are many different types of, of meanings and uh, I think you're right that this could be uh, better defined and um, I mean this could be uh, this could be further explored to, to really think about what this means in terms of yeah m- many types of, of ways to approach this uh, this concept but I would argue that um, that, uh, that on a broad level they they seem to be all enhanced. I mean, maybe maybe there are exceptions, but but wherever I look, I, I see them enhanced. Do you want to uh, have a continuing question, you or um, are you happy with the answer? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it was, uh, yeah, yeah, good answer. And I'm, uh, or yeah, I think also that it really should be more explored. Or there is easily the risk to kind of conflate the different meanings of this meaning. But yeah, I, so it really seems that it works on many different levels, which is also kind of very interesting. How does that kind of general sense of meaning or meaningfulness or kind of non-linguistic or non-semantic meaning and how the semantic meaning or how they are kind of tied together or I think they, or at least I have not come across about any theory that would like probably explain that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, going to the next one from um, from anonymous um, on the mescaline study, what would you expect to find if white Caucasians from the U.S. were placed on one by one in the Mexican healer groups and vice versa? Mexican attendees taken among the clinical research group setting in the U.S. I'm asking this with the interest on the personal internal setting, which is inherited from our homes in conditionings, traumas, culture, etc which we cannot leave behind while attending an authentic original ceremony. Okay, so yeah. A long question, but... Yeah, great. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, that would complexify things, obviously. Um, and I think, you know, you might get, in a sense, mixed results or in a sense, like... Uh, you'd have the Indian participants, maybe, I think they would probably not, I don't know if they might suffer to the same extent uh, as the Caucasians, and, and the Caucasians might enjoy themselves a bit a bit more or, or might uh, extract more value from the experience. I can say that I, I, I think, you know, the... the uh, obviously, it's not about being... Uh, it's not about race or anything of the sort, and I, I believe that we can immerse ourselves, not in the same way, but uh, maybe as indigenous people or, um, or um, people that come from a traditional society where, where this is an integral part of, of their worldview. But, you know, um, I, I've written several papers on uh, Santo Daime, the Brazilian ayahuasca church, uh, about, specifically about the set and setting of the Santo Daime ritual. Uh, Santo Daime evolved in Brazil, um, but it's basically most of the practitioners are, well, they might be Brazilians, but they're urban city dwellers. They weren't brought up with um, with ayahuasca or Santo Daime as part of their lives. Uh, they're from an educated middle class background. And Santo Daime also, um, also went and uh, d- dispersed all over the world. It, you have Santo Daime churches in, in Europe and in, in the US uh, and, and in many other parts of the world. So I think for 
many people, it is possible to, to, um, to change, to exchange or to uh, their, to trade their, their, the set and setting that their society um, um, prescribed for them for another one. Uh, for example, by participating in these kinds of uh, traditional or uh, indigenous practices. So it might not be the same as, you know, being um, living in Seldoma Pia, which is the big uh, Santo Daimi headquarters in the middle of the jungle. And for people growing up there and having this as part of their, um, of their experience uh, and, and world. But, but still, I think, uh, you know, there, there's not a clear cut, any clear cut border and, and people from, from the West can gain a lot by, by uh, buying in or, uh, or recruiting themselves into these kinds of more uh, indigenous kinds of, 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 of contexts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next one uh, is from Mika. Uh, you can ask this question yourself if you open your microphone. Hello, thank you for the pre-presentation. Pre I really enjoyed the pictures. How do you consider adding the drug on the formula when discussing psychedelics like Alastair set and setting or Ayahuasca set and setting or is it fruitful to think in that way or is it is this more trivial you mean like specific sense setting for different types of psychedelics mm, or how the drug the taken drug or taking psychedelic effects yeah the whole co set and setting concept well you know it's i think the, the concept is relevant for all psychedelics and as i've as i've mentioned I, and not only for psychedelics um, the interesting thing for me is how, in, in this regard, is that very often the thing that people ascribe to drugs is really a question of set and setting, and that, and that in many ways, uh, uh, you know, people might ascribe say um, LSD is like this or psilocybin is like that, um, or ayahuasca is like that. One really, so much of that has to do. With the set and setting, with the context, and actually, there was just this study um, published um, uh, sh um, very recently that argues that the LSD and psilocybin are basically indistinguishable in terms of of their effects. And I was quite skeptical of, of these results. Uh, I think they should uh, replicate using uh, experienced psychonauts because uh, most of the people that I know uh, find that uh, the, the results are quite different. Uh, but still, I think it, it points to a, to a very uh, valid argument that, that, that really um, a great part of the, the thing that people kind of uh, uh, project on different psychedelics is just about their own perceptions and individual experiences uh, and and then reifying these or or you know make building these structures or these images of what this drug is and what this drug is when this just really has to do with the circumstances that I use this or that what drug yeah thank you for the answer that's something to think about yeah it's make this whole concept of set and setting it makes it quite difficult to to generalize uh things from from uh, the um, individual experiences or from one specific study um so yeah. let's continue on or do you want to comment on on that i just said you know you say it's, it's difficult to generalize and i always think about you know leary's paper of uh, 1963, which was the first paper to employ this concept of sense setting, and it it's called reactions to psilocybin under a supportive setting, and and you know, and it's interesting that uh, he what he does there, which is saying that uh, you know psychedelic researchers should always say uh, what the context is, and he says in conclusion in his conclusions, I'm not saying this is what psilocybin does, I'm saying this is what it does. 
in these specific types of, of, of context, yeah. Yeah, so it, there needs to be like very uh, careful, it needs, to be, it needs to be carefully reported the, the, the setting and, and the expectations and everything that was done with the intention setting and all. Uh, definitely, and you know, uh, if I may add, I think, you know, today in, in, in our world where we're seeing psychedelic therapy becoming big and, you know, really exploding with uh, drug companies getting into this field and, and, and big money, and the, the danger that I see here is really that by uh, changing the, the whole context for this treatment from this thing that's, you know, that's done by ideologues or, or like people who are commi- committed, de- dedicated to this subject and really believed in it for, for many years, this was run this way. And to something that's done by, um, well, in, in, in many cases for, for profit or in very blatantly capitalistic uh, or kind of profit-driven um, environment, we, we really, we might be um, undermining the potential of psychedelic therapy. And that's something that we need to think closely on and by the way it might also be dif- play out differently in Europe than in the states because I know in Europe there's quite a different framework for thinking about for all these things they're more of a sort of uh, so- social health insurance and and things are covered in a different way which might also change the way that psychedelic therapy works in Europe uh, than in the states mm-hmm. uh, related to that there's um, th- Psychedelics have, have been studied or like kind of spearheaded with a with a context of psychiatry now and and treating mental health and psychotherapy, um, and, and it's gotten a lot of attention at at least from my perspective. Uh, um, um, it seems like that. Uh, maybe it's just in my bubble, but it it seems like every newspaper uh, or many newspapers and and. Uh, uh, podcasts and and talk shows, their TV series, movies. The, uh, psychedelics get mentioned a lot in a in a context of like treating mental health. Do you think this uh, is it? Is it now maybe? Uh, is it an optimal time to for for people to seek uh, mental health treatment um, in this uh, context now? Do, what, what do you think? Is, it, is this like an optimal time for it or does it set up like too high expectations and it's a recipe for, for catastrophic um, disappointments or... <laughs> yeah, no, also the, the question of expectations is always tricky because, you know, if you, the high expectations can be conducive but they can also lead for to disappointment. But I mean, they can be conducive and they can be useful. I mean, people who have high expectations and that have um, and that put their intentions uh, in the same place, they're they're very likely to to get high results or uh, or um, excellent types of results. So so there is a in a sense like fooling yourself the same way as in placebo so you know placebo is like fooling yourself but it ends up being useful so this might be useful as well uh, i would say generally about the question of whether it's a good time or not a good time that it's just um you know there's there's so much going on and it's hard to it's uh, the, it's messy it's hard to say you know things will be different in a year or in five years and people are experimenting with these compounds or, or people are having these experiences in research, but you know, so, so many more people are having them in uh, underground psychedelic therapy and all of these other sorts of, of environments. Uh, so they're all uh, a bit different. And some people are having them trying to basically heal themselves or, or just doing that in, in rituals, in religious rituals, which can be healing in themselves. So, you know, I think, you know, we, uh, for, mo- for most people, they're not, you know, they, they can't wait for, uh, I mean, I don't know, if people can wait, maybe in five years time, uh, uh, we, we have a better idea and some people uh, wait for the research and uh, that, that's true, but um, 
in, in many cases, research re remains, I mean, the discussion about psychedelics has been going on for many years, and I, I suspect for many people, uh, the, the messiness and, and the fact that set and setting the psychedelics, that there's nothing um, like guaranteed here, that there's like, when entering a psychedelic experience, you have to know that you have the potential of, of going to heaven or going to hell, as, as Huxley said. So accepting that is, is part of the game, I think, and trying to intelligently uh, handle that and, and work with that, um, but also accepting that there's, there are a lot of unknowns and, um, in, in this, in, in this uh, enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting to the to the end now. Uh, probably the first time we get to uh, ask all the questions, which is which is great. Thank you, for, uh, Ida, for uh, for your time here. Uh, the, there's a question about uh, intentions, or how how do you see this in the perspective of set and set and setting? We um, touched on this briefly, but um, any any ideas on that? How how is intention, intention. related? Yeah, well, um, I published a, a magazine called La, La Psychonaut. It's uh, in Hebrew. It was uh, published um, in uh, several years back, and I, I had a, a paper there, a non-academic paper about intention and integration. And I think intention is uh, is crucial. It's uh, perhaps the most meaningful factor of all the factors of set setting, uh, because so many of these things there, I mean, there there's something that you that you embark with. I mean, with your personality, with your expectations, you're in a in a place, you're with people, but they can go wrong. You can find out it's the wrong kind of people today, or these weren't the, the people that you really needed right now. This place is actually, it's not the perfect place like you thought it would be, or so on and so forth. Uh, the expectations can be, um, can be thwarted. But intention is something that, that's extremely powerful and that we can bring with us into any kind of, of situation with psychedelics. Uh, it's something, it's engaging, it's active, it's... Uh, it, it's where uh, the individual is able to bring themselves. And really, I think so much in, uh, of the secret in psychedelic work is, you know, not waiting for this to happen to me, but, uh, but working actively towards healing, working actively towards serving. Uh, and so I think uh, intention is like this compass that you can always use. Like even if you're at the worst condition or state within a psychedelic experience, it's always possible to grasp back at the intention and and try to use that intention to to steer to 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 good grounds to to being of use to to yourself to others to healing, and so. Um, and and we have great evidence that that that's that that's immensely powerful. I think both on a research level, but also very much on a on a just anecdotal person to person level. So so yeah, I think intention is uh, is very important and is something that we um, the the first thing maybe that we we need to always um, keep in mind. Yeah, it's a good point that it's a kind of a continuing process and uh, this kind of road to healing. It's it's not um, maybe it's not so useful to think of it as just a one uh, discrete event where I ingest a, a substance and and uh, that would do do the tricks. Um, so we're, we're uh, finishing around around now. So um, just before we finish, I'm I'm gonna share um, my screen for for a minute. Um, here we go. Uh, so just to mention about our upcoming events. Uh, so right now we we are expecting in, in some sometime in May. Um, um, a, a local 
Doctor of Medicine Jani Kajanoja will be speaking about um, psychedelics, uh, suffering and medicalization. And um, uh, the specific time will be, will be informed later. And, and uh, more webinars coming, coming uh, after, after May also. Um, so you can uh, apply for a membership if, if uh, you are uh, in a relevant field to, to research or, or uh, uh, medicine. Also, you can apply for a sponsor membership in our, in our uh, website, shooter.fi. Uh, you can follow us on on these social social medias, and um, uh, here's the info to to our website and and uh, email. Okay, uh, Ida, would you do you have uh, any final words you would like to share before we? Uh, well, I think I've already thing. shared them. I just want to say it was uh, thank you for the invitation. And it was a pleasure. And um, I hope we keep the, all these uh, insights in mind. Thank you very much for, for your time uh, and, and for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so we leave uh, with this. Have a good rest of the night. Bye-bye.